Welcome to Interplay. This is Michael Shapiro, your host. This conversation in music has two dear old friends, Lucille Chong, Alessio Bax. Hello. Hi, Michael. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. It's great to see you. So flourishing and so beautiful, both of you. <laughs> thank you. Likewise. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, you know, the, 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 the amazing thing about you both is that I've been following what you've been doing for so many years. And it's such a wide uh, uh, repertoire and such a large story that in our half an hour, I don't think I can get to it because like me, you're compelled to work all the time. Whether you're doing your solo work as solo pianists, which is extraordinary and you both bring different things, we'll get to that. Or when you're doing chamber music, like your wonderful new festival in Siena, my my home in Italy, which we'll get to, or whether you're playing together, which I find fascinating. Now, Lucille, what do you most respect and love about Alessio's playing? I would say his sound and the range he produces. He can go from the most beautiful pianissimos to the roaring fortissimos, but always beautifully done. And um, when you always think that, oh, he can't go any further, he always pushes the em envelope. And that's what I admire most. Thank you. Okay, that, that's a good answer. I will <laughs> not ask you both what you don't, what, what you do, what you don't like. <laughs> I won't do that. That would be so bad. No, I'm this just is like kidding. a couple's game show. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Perfetto. Then it turns into the dating game, and I don't want to do that. Yeah. Alessio, what do you love most about Lucille's playing? I, I think the, the, the commitment and the, um, the authenticity of her playing. Every note uh, really speaks to you, and it comes from, from her heart and her soul, and she's able to, uh, to make it come alive. You know, and uh, the range also of those emotions and colors is incredible. And, and just the level of commitment of every single, uh, no, of her only, but of every single note she plays. I would agree with those comments because it's really something else. I, I cannot believe every time I listen to you both play, either uh, on recordings or, um, you know, um, when we see broadcasts, it's phenomenal. And there's every kind of thing coming out, every color, every musicianship, and it's very sincere and very organic and very different, the two of you. Now, here's the trick question. I know you've said when you play together, I've read something I think that Lucille wrote, that you don't even have to talk too much when you're practicing together. Like you did this recent record, uh, uh, recording, phenomenal of the Stravinsky, Petrushka, Four Hands, which I think I read, tell us more, was from his own forehand version for the ballet? Yes. When they were, wor when they were working? Yes. First, how did you, I, I heard uh, uh, Rubinstein do the one-handed, the, the two-handed version, but where, you know, which was phenomenal. But where did you get this four-handed version? Tell us about it. Um, well, I was, I've been obsessed with Petrushka since I was eight years old. Um, I heard a two-handed version, which is an abridged suite. It's just three movements of Petrushka. It's a, a piano showpiece. Uh, and I went to the, to the sheet music store with my dad. I was eight years old and asked for the score of Petrushka. And the clerk like, was like, you, you little boy, <laughs> want the Petrushka. And so he looked and all he could find was a full orchestral score and this version of uh, the complete ballet that uh, Stravinsky did for uh, one piano for hands. Uh, and so I kept that and I studied the score with recordings. It was uh, Claudio Baudo, London Symphony, I remember. And I was just so obsessed with this music, the colors, the story. I didn't know much about the story itself because uh, I hadn't watched the ballet until many years later, but somehow the music itself was telling me so much more than the story even. Uh, and then I waited all those years to find someone crazy enough to attempt the, <laughs> the, the version for piano for hands. And that was Lucille. Uh, and since then we've played it, you know, all over the world on tours in Siberia and, uh, and major, major cities and small cities. And, and recently we recorded it for uh, uh, Signum uh, on the CD. And then uh, even more recently during the pandemic for a broadcast from the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center. Which I saw, which is phenomenal. Now, when you're practicing this, I mean, I remember doing Brahms symphonies with my brother, you know, in the forehand version and 
the Schubert pieces with other pianists. Now, you're in an unusual circumstance. You're both powerhouse pianists, top level, gloriously so. You're also husband and wife, and you share a beautiful child. Yeah. It just gets ravishing. I mean, are you going to lock the doors in about five years with this baby? Or sooner. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my God, I have a daughter also. Oh, my God, she's so pretty. Bless her heart. So let's get back to the two of you. You play together. Of course, you play separately, and you have separate careers, but you also play together, which is a, another career. And you're married, and you love each other, and you live together, and you build a life together. What's it like practicing together, Lucille? Minimal. <laughs> <laughs> That's the secret of our success, minimal. No, but honestly, um, I think we have the same musical vision and we know each other's playing. So we bypass a lot of, you know, time and we just get to the core. We already know what who will sound better on top or on bottom or on piano one or on piano two. We've rarely changed once we've learned the parts. Uh, we've rarely switched it up unless, you know, we have to play it with other people. Um, and then somehow we just kind of know what kind of sound we want, direction we want, musical structure. So as I said before, we don't really talk so much. We kind of like nod and we understand. <laughs> it, it, it's very little. Yeah, I mean, uh, piano for hands is, is very, very tricky. I mean, you were saying about reading symphonies with friends and that there's that social part of piano for hands, which is amazing and it's a lot of fun. But then when it comes to actually performing as a piano, do especially complex scores like the Stravinsky, um, that's really high precision <laughs> work uh, that w either, either you know, it works beautifully or it just crashes because there's just no room for error, really. It's like, it's like this clock. You know, Stravinsky, I think it was Robert Kraft, but Stravinsky supposedly said that he hates that Ravel. He's like a Swiss clockmaker. Yeah. <laughs> but so the precision, the prezioso, you know, of this, of that piece especially, the it's rhythm, good. the crossing of hands, the, you know, everything it is so difficult. Now, I understand what you just said about primo and secondo, which is in... Uh, you know, four hands version, the top part and the bottom part. I could see how Lucille would play primo in the in the in the Petrushka. The colors that she can do up top, and the colors that you can do down below and in the middle. You know, so, so you're understanding the dynamic how it works. There's Absolutely, that. and also the fact that in a piece like Petrushka, so someone usually, I mean, this goes back and forth but uh, someone is in the driver's seat and I think it's easier to drive from the bottom. <laughs> so, um, you know. Ah, uh, I see. So. <laughs> Lucille says, that's not right. <laughs> well, it, it, the Petrushka is more complicated because it goes back and forth. There are right. times, it's so extreme. It's really trying to cram so many colors, many instruments, so many stories and characters into one instrument and that's piano right. and four hands that, that, for example, there are, moments where Lucille has to take the pedal, which is something that in, in Schubert or Mozart is it always, never uh, it never happens, always the bottom takes care, you know, the one that has the harmonies. And so, so in Petrushka, it's a little more complicated, but normally I think, um, I love playing top where you have a feeling that you never get as a pianist in chamber music of um, being able to, uh, to unfold a beautiful melody and the rest of the texture is already there waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's incredible. That's how a singer must feel like and how a, a violinist must feel like. And, and we never get that. So in okay. the, it's like Schubert, it, it's so liberating. And, and there you need a lot of trust, you know, because... Um, well, if you, if, the, if you two don't have trust, no one does. <laughs> <laughs> now, Lucille, when yeah. do you go to the secondo part what pieces have you done that? And uh, Alessio goes to Primo. Well, we've done a lot of uh, Brahms Hungarian dances. I'm at the bottom. Uh, um, um, what else? Uh, Ravel, we kind of switch, or Debussy, sometimes I'm on top. It, it's, it just depends on the piece itself. Uh, but which Ravel have you done in four hands? Uh, Ma Mère Noire and the We did Laval's two pianos. pianos. And I'm second piano for that. Um, we did WC um, en blanc et noir, and I'm on top for that. So uh, I don't know. It's just how the piece is construct 
constructed, how it sounds, just, just the textures. I tend to gravitate on um, a bit more atmospheric, a bit more um, clear, clearer textures for myself and where I can drive a little more emotional impact. And uh, Alessio goes more for the rhythmical impact, and, and it's interesting. Like, it, like uh, the, maybe it's something that you shouldn't have asked. Yeah. Now, now we're thinking about it. No, recently we did uh, afternoon of a fawn, uh, uh, WC transcribed by Ravel, and um, we decided right away that I should be on top, and there was no questions asked. I don't know yeah. why. Yeah, you know? and usually I think. Psychologically, I would have taken the top for that piece, but we just it's knew just, just, he would yeah. sound better. But and there was no argument. We just yeah, it's decided. Wow. I, honestly, I think she's so so great that the, we could work either way. <laughs> so <laughs> so I just I don't I don't have to worry about which which part they choose. <laughs> I really think that's correct. And you know you can't really switch off concert to concert, but it's an interesting thing. What's the business these days of, quote, selling a duo versus a solo career? Is there a business to it these days? Lucille. I, I think so. I think there's a, a pull of just to see um, the happy people or people enjoying what they do together. And, you know, like we're both pianists. We don't need to play with each other. If you're a violinist or cellist or a, a, an instrumentalist, you need someone there with you. But as a pianist, we're used to this kind of solo world, and um, I think we're cute together. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's something that we never we never really pursued yeah. or pushed. I mean, and people asked us, and then we did it. We loved it, and then um, and then they keep asking. It's it's interesting. Again, it's not a need as a pianist to find another pianist to play with, uh, but our criteria so far, we feel so lucky. It's been you know, if it's repertoire that we love and places that we like to go to, then we say yes. <laughs> that's that's been that simple i wish everything was that simple in life well i'm seven i'm 70 now and i will tell you that i remember two piano two pianos or forehand folks over the years they were career people they just did that i don't think i know of any other maybe you can tell me is historically in our life collective lifetimes has there been any two people like you that have established large solo careers with recordings of, of Ligeti and Poulenc and Beethoven and Rachmaninoff and all the things that you guys do. But has, have we ever seen two solo pianists who have huge solo careers who also do forehands and are married? Hmm. I, don't, I don't know this. It usually what? doesn't end up well. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it is. Well, there's Claude Frank and Lillian Kilier that that that's toured right. a lot. Yeah, that's that's uh, right. They did. They did. I remember them, of course. But in but, our kind of generation or lifetime, I don't think it's so. I mean, again, I think piano forehand is a highly specialized thing, and um, there are a lot of great pianists that are happy to get together and play at festivals, for example. Yeah. But. Uh, I honestly think that, that you cannot get the same um, results um, or you cannot go in, in, in depth as much. I mean, you can do that with a violinist, with a singer. I mean, I, we both play with a lot of people and it's always uh, always great. But I think for the fact that you're sharing the same instrument makes it much more complicated. So to have an in-house pianist is quite essential, I think. It's <laughs> unbelievable what you have. I want to mention something. Have you done the symphonic dances in the piano in the piano version, the four hands? I, played, I haven't played it with uh, with Lucille. I've played it once with uh, another great pianist, Orion Weiss. Oh yeah, and it was great. And I've done a few few things with Orion, and it's been always always great, um, but very different. You guys have to do it. The reason I'm mentioning is I only read recently that uh, at uh, Rachmaninoff's estate, just pre-war in um uh, you know in lucerne on the lake I, because i'm friendly with 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 jimmy and Jeannie galway and they live across from where the rachmaninoff house was that horowitz went there once right before the big war started and rachmaninoff invited him and the two of them played the forehand version at the piano mm -hmm. yeah that's would amazing. have loved would have loved to be a, a mosquito on the wall you know that you know, the been... incredible recording that resurfaced recently 
of, uh, and it was like a homemade recording of uh, Rachmaninoff kind of improvising his own made up arrangement of the symphonic dances for one, for two hands, which is unbelievable. Yeah, I heard it. I heard it. For Ormandy, you know, to, and he's like singing, you heard that, it's amazing. And it's probably one of the best performances of the piece <laughs> that are some of the most amazing piano playing, just even just that alone, incredible. Yeah. Well, the Philadelphia Orchestra, you know, is was his orchestra. It was Rachmaninoff's orchestra, there's no question about it. And still in Yannick's dressing room, he's got a picture of Ormandy and Rachmaninoff, the famous one, on his wall. Um, I want to go to Siena now. When I was a kid... <laughs> I'd love to go to Siena right now. <laughs> now. Alitalia, let's go. We go together. I'll buy tickets. So we go to Siena, okay? And you have a festival there now that you're directing. Incontri in terra di Siena. It's a beautiful name. Incontri is like meetings, I suppose, meeting. get-togethers, you know. And you have this wonderful chamber series, basically, with some concerti, with, with one orchestra. I know you put an orchestra together for a concert coming up, which Andrew Litton's going to conduct of concerti. But then you select these locations in the environs, in the environment of Siena, not necessarily in Siena, but outside, like La Foce, this amazing estate, which has the most beautiful gardens I've ever seen, right, not far away, places like Pieve, Monte Pulciano, the, the Teatro Mascagni, all these amazing, amazing places, uh, little opera house jewels. How do you select repertoire for these things? Oh my God, that's a very good question. Uh, there, are, there's a long list of of dream works that I've been wanting to program or hear. And uh, although I, my my criteria is never to force music upon musicians, and I want to listen to their suggestions as well. So it's uh, usually I start with one work that I really want to include in the program. And uh, so far, I've been programming for five years. The festival is going to be in its 33rd year, but I took over only from, from 2017, the artistic part of it. And so I start with one work and then I create a balanced program around it. I, I'm not a big fan for festivals of, of themes, themed program, because uh, I think sometimes it can be very interesting. Intellectual is always interesting, but uh, it's like a meal, you know? Uh, you want as balanced, as, as satisfying as, as possible. And then the themes actually create themselves. You know, you can, uh, you can tweak uh, this or that piece or move it to another concert and make, make a nice, nice theme, but that's never my, my starting point. But it, it always starts from, from dreams, like thinking, you know, how would uh, Emmanuel Payut and Ian Bostridge sound in Ravel um, with Lucille? And so we programmed Chanson Madecas and oh. I know Incredible. I mean, it's something that, that Ian hadn't done it. Emmanuel, of course, done many times, but not with Ian. And, and his voice was just unbelievable in it. It was a discovery for all of us, including him. Um, and so things like that, you know, it's really, I feel like a kid in a, in a candy store. Well, you talk, about, you talk about a meal. I've heard this before. Eddie Aaron, who I've worked with, talks about building programs. He's on chamber music concerts, as you know. And you know, here you have, it, you're in Italy, okay? So it's this primo piatto, secondo piatto, and then salata. So you have, <laughs> and then dolce. That's my inspiration. And also, you know, I, I programmed the meals around, around the concerts well. As this well. is something I read about, and this I'm going to hold you to, is <laughs> eating. Yes. I recently had a, a, a conversation with my dear friend, Giancarlo Guerrero, who talks about, he says, we'll do a concert together, it's to be fun, but then afterwards we're going to go out. <laughs> <laughs> now you're in Italy, the greatest food in the world, in my book. I've never eaten, you know, peaches like I had in Italy or salumi or, you know, oh my God, so many things, pasta. But the bringing together also in festivals of friends, because in this business, as it were, this quotes business that we're in, the gathering of friends you know, the incontri yeah. with Amici is for me the ball game. Absolutely. It's, it's yeah. got to be great fun for you both, isn't it, Lucille? How do you find this? Yes, you hit the nail right on the spot because um, first, 
I think it, they correlate. Great musicians are great personalities, great friends, and they enjoy music. They enjoy eating together and drinking oh, together. Yeah. So oh, this yeah. is what I do idyllic space and you know the surroundings are not too bad as well and um we're lucky throughout the years we have many common friends now and and we kind of um you know many musicians love to come back to the Encontri festivals such as Emmanuel Fayou, Daishin Kashimoto I mean many come back from year to year they they beg to come back and so and there's so much repertoire and, and it's interesting how Alessio loves to incorporate uh, new faces, new people with, you know, older friends of ours. And, and it's quite interesting. And for us to, to, to be in that environment and to, to have camaraderie and good food and, and wonderful music is just inspiring. And we look forward to it every summer. You know, at the very beginning of the festival, way before I was involved, Antonio Lisi, the cellist, uh, is in Los Angeles now. Um, he founded the festival at La Focha and that was the whole idea. Musicians, friends would come, stay together one or two weeks and then present a program and they would come with the whole family. And so the kids growing up together, you know, since then the festival is expanded quite a bit and, you know, there's audience flying in uh, just to come and hear the concerts, for example, and there's amazing musicians. Uh, but that spirit is still there. You know, that we already after five years, the kids are growing up together and our, our Mila wants, wants, is looking forward to see what, what you know, I don't know, what Daishin's kid is coming up and what he's doing, uh, what she's doing. Um, I mean, it's, it's quite, quite, quite special. And I'm convinced, I mean, what drives me is that I know you can get the same musicians in the same repertoire in a different place and they will sound different. Um, and that's the connection of the music of these international renowned musicians with, with the place itself. And, and that's a that question. You know, when I was in Siena in the mid seventies, we had concerts, these concerts in very strange places. One was in a bombed out village on a mountaintop that no one was living in. And we came together for a concert there. I think Salvatore Accardo played in chamber music. It was really fascinating, but the environment of being in that climate during the summer it was August or July, and you know in the evening when it cooled down, and being in that circumstance and hearing a Haydn string quartet, exactly. breathtaking. Yeah. That's so crazy. I tell all of our, our listeners, get on that plane, Go to the <laughs> Incontri in Terra di Siena. Go to the website. Look and see what Lucille and Alessio are doing there. It is absolutely extraordinary. And I, for one, cannot wait to go. Yes, absolutely. So to finish this talk, I, 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 I just throw out something for you both. We've been through a horror, you know, this past year. So many people lost throughout the world. And this whole industry, you know, friends in the Philharmonic, in the Met, Broadway, you know, put in a terrible position. What do you both, what is your, I know what I'm doing, but what is your underlying raison d'etre, your reason to be going forward? What do you want to change, change? Now that you young folks, I can say that being older, where do you want to go now? Wow, that's a powerful question. Do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think we all reevaluated re re our balances in life. So uh, we have a young daughter, you know, she's uh, six. And, and so family time has been at the center of everything. You know, I used to be gone um, 10 months out of the year. And now, now I've been home every single day. Uh, and so there are amazing things related to that and, and amazing challenges as well. So um, after whenever things will resume in a, in a way that was similar to um, pre-pandemic, um, what's my choice, you know? Do I have to be on the road that long or can I structure it differently? Or can I, um, the, the business has changed in that uh, there was a necessity and there still is of producing um, things uh, virtually. Now, how is that going to be incorporated? It's not going to go away, you know, once the vaccine, vaccines are rolled out. That's something that as a festival, for example, as a small festival with a small budget, we are having to face now. Even if you get people there, they're, they're 
going to be a huge audience that's been exposed to what we produced last year digitally that's expecting that as well. I know. So, so there is that balance. Uh, and finding a happy medium um, in which, within which both can coexist and, and really inspire one another rather than cancel one another. Uh, so there's a relationship between digital, virtual versus in person. There's a relationship between touring and family time. Uh, and so hopefully we can all find a solution. And, and it has to um, be different for each one of us, I think. Well, thank you for virtually meeting with me today between New York City and Chappaqua. We're not that far from each other. Not that far. And, but, uh, no, go ahead. No, it's just been a blessing seeing you both and seeing you in such good spirits and so creative and pushing the envelope always. I just love the work that you both do. I just love it. Thank you so much. Likewise, we're big, big fans. And then I hope to do this in person very soon. Yes. Are you? Can you cook? <laughs> I think you can. <laughs> I've, been, I've been practicing cooking every single day during this. So That's right. <laughs> We got better. Alessio Box, Lucille Chung, thank you for joining me on Interplay. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you, Michael. This is Michael Shapiro, your host for Interplay Conversations and in Music. Thank you for joining us.